Okay. Um, welcome, uh, everyone, to this week's Colosseum uh, of the School of Astrophysics. We are very glad to have Professor Dhrubo Gupta from Gopi uh, Institute in Kolkata as our speaker today. Professor Gupta did his uh, PhD from Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics uh, in 2001, and then he did a postdoc at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the uh, Triangle University Nuclear Laboratory. And then he moved on to another postdoc uh, in Paris. Uh, and, uh, and instead of saying the difficult to pronounce French name, I just said the name of the Institute for Nuclear Physics in Paris. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then he came back uh, to, uh, to India and became a uh, CSIR field officer uh, at GCC. Uh, and then in finally 2008, he became a faculty member at both institutes where he has uh, been since then. And he's now the chair of the Department of Physical Sciences at both institutes. Professor Hitler's research interests are in nuclear reactions and nuclear astrophysics, utilizing radioactive ion beams at CARN, ICOLG, and GANIL. Currently, uh, he's working on uh, breakup and transfer reactions with uh, seven beryllium and nine lithium nuclei. And throughout his career, he has worked on various nuclear physics uh, problems involving, including uh, seven lithium breakup experiments at Bart CIF for Celestron, giving uh, his PhD, then low energy proton proton scattering, and nuclear reactions involving exotic nuclei at the Ganning radioactive ion beam facility. Giving his uh, postdoc science and heavy ion beams and charge particle detector arrays for the supercondition cytotherapy. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here and for this nice introduction. And I have uh, enjoyed interacting with the students very much. And I'm really impressed by the uh, extent of uh, research work being carried out in this department. School of Astrophysics. So today I'm going to talk on the cosmological lithium problem in nuclear astrophysics. So to start with my talk, I would first like to quote Carl Sagan from Cosmos that the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. So we are made of star stuff. Stop moving. Okay, so my t shirt actually uh, gives the correct uh, message that the person in this t shirt is 13.8 billion years old. On all of you. Okay. So this is the plan of my talk. So I would touch nuclear astrophysics, rare isotope beams, and exotic nuclei in the context of the cosmological lithium problem, acronym as CLIP, CLIP, and uh, whether there is a nuclear physics solution to this problem. And I will discuss our experiment on the beryllium seven plus deuteron reaction at CERN to find a nuclear physics solution to the problem. And lastly, I will discuss the results and output. So nuclear astrophysics aims to understand the origin of elements and energy generation in stars. So this is the time since Big Bang. And during the formation of the universe 13.8 billion years ago in the Big Bang, only the lightest elements were formed. So this is a few minutes after the Big Bang when the mutual interactions between the nucleons led to the formation of light nuclei, hydrogen and helium, along with trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. So this is the era of nucleosynthesis, commonly known as Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Now all the other elements are formed much later in the stars. The subsequent nuclear processes synthesize the heavier nuclei during stellar evolution and in violent events like supernovae. Now from astronomical observations, it is found that hydrogen and helium constitute about 74% and 24% of all baryonic matter in the universe. The heavy elements comprise the rest 
So the natural question is why these elements are found in their observed abundance? To answer that, we have to appreciate that nuclear physics plays a key role in the processes that take place in the universe. These nuclear reactions produce neutron and proton-rich exotic nuclei. To understand where the elements come from and their abundance, the properties of exotic nuclei and the nuclear reactions which created them must be understood. So this actually led to a worldwide effort into pursuing rare isotope science. By rare isotopes, I mean unstable isotopes or nuclei that are not found naturally on Earth, and therefore it's exotic. And these isotopes can only be produced and studied in the laboratory. So these measurements involved in this laboratory, the measurements involve exotic nuclei, which are very neutron and proton rich. So this is the worldwide facilities in rare isotope beams. You need a beam to do the experiments, a beam of rare isotopes. So these green colors are the countries which have these facilities. This is the nuclear physics equivalent of a gold rush, rare isotope rush. So obviously the goal is to study nuclear structure, reactions, and astrophysics. The experiments with the new isotopes produced will lead to a detailed description of nuclei, explain the origin of the elements in the cosmos, providing an understanding of matter and neutron stars, etc. So new rare isotope beam, uh, also called radioactive ion beam, R RIB, these facilities are coming up all over the world. And also there are several upgrades being carried out at present for the already established facilities. So it can be envisaged that cutting edge experiments in nuclear science would pervade the near future. Now, you know that nuclear physics studies require beams of energetic particles to induce nuclear reactions on target nuclei. This actually led to the development of accelerators and exploration of stable nuclei along the value of stability. So this is the story during 1950s to 1980s. The unstable nuclei with extra protons or neutrons form the valley walls. So this is a value of stability. So here it's more protons, here it's more neutrons. So unstable nuclei with extra protons or neutrons, they form the valley walls, which decay quickly, even within milliseconds. The limits of nuclear binding, so these are the limits, where for a fixed number of protons, no more neutrons can be bound, or vice versa, the so-called drip lines, the proton drip line and the neutron drip line, these were largely unknown. Also, the neutron side of the valley is poorly understood as compared to the proton side. Your scientists aren't sure where the drip lines exactly lies. So with the advent of radioactive ion beam facilities, explorations of these limits started in the 1990s. Now, in very neutron-rich nuclei, the neutrons will reach far beyond the proton distributions. So there is a separation of the neutron and proton density distribution. So this separation might cause some changes in nuclear properties. Particularly, the spin orbit term may be substantially modified, causing changes in shell structure, and which may have serious consequences in stellar nucleosynthesis. So how do you produce these exotic nuclei? So these are short-lived, so it's very tricky because in when you are dealing with stable nuclei, you have a projectile and a target, you do a nuclear reaction, you detect the emitted fragments, and you come to some conclusion. But here, we have to deal with nuclei which are very short-lived. So you have to produce them and immediately take them to the experimental station and do the experiment. So it's very tricky. So this requires innovative exotic beam facilities with high quality energetic beams of short-lived isotopes. So these short-lived isotopes are produced essentially by two methods. One is the projectile fragmentation method. Another is the ISOL method. The ISOL stands for isotope separator online. Now in this method, a heavy ion beam like uranium of energy say 100 MeV per nucleon to one GeV per nucleon hits a thin target. There is a thin target here like beryllium or carbon. The reaction products here 
escape from the target and a very strongly forward focus. There is a fragment separator, which is an electromagnetic element. This separates the reaction products and you get a radioactive ion beam and you immediately transport it to the experimental station to do the experiment. In case of the ISO method, it's a light ion beam, such as proton of energy like 1 GeV, is irradiated on a hot, thick target, like uranium, to induce fragmentation of fission reactions. So these products, they diffuse out to an ion source, where they are ionized, and after extraction, they are separated and post-accelerated, and then they are taken to the experimental cell. With the advent of these uh, highly sophisticated accelerators, which are two stages, um, like first is the production stage, and then uh, the next is the actually reaction stage. So now we have ion beams of all elements from protons to uranium. These are now available. So this leads to this world of nuclei. So here you see these black dots. These are the well-known and stable nuclei. And this yellow region are the nuclei which are unstable, and we have studied a little bit about them. But there is a vast green region, which is an unknown period, called terra incognita. So all these whole uh, landscape consists of about 7,000 nuclei, and we try to develop our knowledge of 300 stable nuclei to describe the nuclear landscape of about 7,000 nuclei. And I have already said that from the grip lines, these nuclei on the either side of the stability live only for a finite time, and they undergo beta decay and go to the kind of stability. Now, when we study these outer edges of this unstable region, there have been major discoveries of unexpected new phenomena. The exotic nuclei that we studied, they have some strange structures like nuclear halos, nuclear schemes, and also a modification of magic numbers. So you have studied in your textbook magic numbers like 2, 8, 20, 28, but now we have magic numbers 14, 16, 32. So it, uh, there is, I mean, lots of major discoveries and these exotic nuclei are, I mean, it's uh, immensely strange structures and phenomena are being observed in case of these exotic nuclei. Those are like in the images. I, I'm just I'll just show you. Uh, okay, so here I show you this famous halo nucleus, the maybe the first discovered halo nucleus. This was discovered in 1985 by a postdoc, Misal Tanihata at Berkeley. And then this uh, new nuclear physics. I call when I teach my students, I call it reincarnation of nuclear physics. And so uh, with this nucleus actually started that. So here. This is a lithium 11 nucleus. It has got three protons. And in the core lithium 9, it has got six neutrons. But these two extra core neutrons, they partially escape this type group grip of the core and spend most of their time outside the nuclear core. So this leads to an extended volume of low density neutral matter surrounding the dense core. It has a very low separation energy of 300 kV. Now you see that the size of this lithium 11 nucleus, this is of the size, around the size of a lead nucleus. So it's how much it is extended. So it's, it, the two halo neutrons in lithium 11, they move in a volume typical of a lead nucleus, which is 24 times the volume occupied by the lithium 9 core. So this, for this halo nuclei, the weak binding and short range nuclear force Due to this, the neutrons can tunnel out to the classically forbidden region, and the uncertainty principle ensures that such bound states have a short lifetime, a few milliseconds to some seconds. So there are some characteristics of yellow nuclear, like there has to be decoupling of core and balanced particles, there is a very small separation energy, and there is very low orbital angular momentum, otherwise the halo would not form. So that's why there is, a, due to the Coulomb barrier, there is a very few cases of proton halo candidates, mainly it's neutron halo. So now I would like to just show you this very famous paper in 1948, the alpha, beta, gamma paper. This is alpha and beta and gamma. I think alpha was a PhD student of this, uh, of beta and gamma. So this paper was on the origin of chemical elements. Now, the standard Big Bang model of the primordial universe 
is very successful in accounting for the observed abundance of the light elements. The only astrophysical input to the Big Bang nucleosynthesis calculation is the baryon density of the universe, which is now known very precisely. However, the Billion theory fails to predict correctly the observed abundance of lithium cells. So this brings us to the cosmological lithium problem. Here in this graph, you see these bands, which are observations, and these lines are the Billion predictions. So Billion theory over predicts the abundance of lithium-7 here by about a factor of three. The theory uses the baryon to photon ratio eta from the cosmic microwave background by the this measured by this W map and Planck satellites. Only for lithium-7, there is a serious discrepancy. While there is very good agreement of Vivian predicted abundances with observations for the light and nuclear. Now for decades, it's not like almost 40 years now, for decades, this is one of the most important unresolved problems in nuclear astrophysics. So if we have to find a solution, we have to find a process which reduces the lithium problem because Vivian overpredicts the observation. So what may be the different processes that can reduce the lithium cell? So first you can search for astrophysical solutions in the stellar processing, lithium-7 may be described in metal core stars through diffusion and turbulent mixing. But in later works, improvements in observationally inferred primordial lithium abundance, uh, once these new experiments were done, it was found to be very difficult to justify enough destruction of lithium. People even worked on physics beyond standard models to search for a solution. The destruction of mass seven nucleides through interaction with wind, these are weakly interacting massive particles, which are unstable particles in the early universe that could have affected BBN. Even people thought of beryonate as a bound nuclei. You know, beryonate is unbound. So it, it, it immediately breaks up into two alpha particles. Now, had beryllium 8 been bound during BBN, that might have also affected this lithium abundance. Now, all these things assume interpretations, all these interpretations assume that nuclear reaction rates are known very accurately. Now, before invoking these non-standard and exotic scenarios, it is necessary to better constrain nuclear physics inputs to the BBN theory. What actually is done is that reaction cross-sections are measured in MAP at BBN energies, and the reaction rates are given as input to the BBN report. So why not uh, better constrain the nuclear physics input before going to these exotic scenarios. So if we consider the nuclear physics aspects of the this lithium problem, we would see that in BBN, lithium-7 is effectively destroyed through this P alpha reaction. And 95% uh, of the primordial lithium-7 is actually a byproduct of the beta decay from beryllium-7 after the cessation of nucleosynthesis. So it's the source of lithium-7 is mainly beryllium-7. So if we have to search for a solution in a nuclear physics way, we have to then uh, study beryllium-7 because this leads to lithium-7. So if we search for the production and destruction channels of beryllium-7, we see that this reaction is mainly the production channel of beryllium-7, but this is well studied in laboratory with uncertainty less than 5%. But the destruction channels, these three reactions are important. Destruction by neutrons, by these two channels, and destruction by deuterons. Now, there has been several works in CERN to study this destruction by neutrons, and those were found to be insufficient to account for the anomaly. So the only reaction that is left out is this beryllium 7 BP beryllium 8 star, which then breaks up into two alpha particles. So there have been some theoretical works which predict that poorly measured or unknown resonances in this reaction may enhance the cross-section of beryllium-7 destruction. So that might account for the lithium-7 anomaly. So can beryllium-7 plus deuteron actually solve the anomaly? There were some sensitivity studies uh, that in this reaction, if the reaction rate is larger by a factor of 100, that will solve the anomaly. So there may be some resonant enhancement in this particular reaction that we need to search first. So <clears throat> what is the proposed beryllium-7 destruction mechanism? So this deuteron plus beryllium-7, this reaction can lead to a very highly excited state in boron line, 
which might decay by proton and beryl uh, emission of beryl at a very highly excited state, which will then decay into two alpha particles. So, if, are there some contributions of these higher excited states in beryl that might account for that extra cross section of destroying beryl 7, whether that can solve the lithium anomaly? So, this uh, uh, destruction reaction uh, was studied since long back, even in Caltech 1960, and then Luvanilov in Belgium, it is a radioactive anomaly in 2005, and then in Oak Ridge 2011, and also Osaka RCMP 2011, and lastly in 2019 at Florida State. But all in the data in all of these experiments, there is large uncertainty in energy and cross section at BBN energies. It's very difficult to measure because of low statistics. The beryllium 7 destruction could be enhanced by unknown or poorly measured resonances, but it was not correctly found. So, to determine fully the contribution of this particular reaction to the lithium abundance, it needs to be measured for beryllium excitation around 16 MeV, which was not done earlier. So, people could study only up to like 13 MeV excitations, but not above that. But there are several excited states above that which might. We, there are some resonances there which might account for this cross section. So, this actually led to uh, the proposal that I gave in 2012 to Sun uh, to measure this particular reaction. Now, this is the first project from an institute in India that was approved at high ISOD. Now, ISOD stands for Isotope Separator Online Device. This high stands for higher intensity and energy. Now, when I gave this proposal, 2012, there was only ISOLD, there was no high ISOLD. The um, facility was being built at that time, and it was built only in 2016. So you can see that the facility is built in 2016, but they accepted proposals in 2012 itself. And in 2017, they gave uh, local users to use the machine, because there will be lots of problems in the machine. And I could get in time only in 2018. So there is a long wait from 2012 to till 2018 to carry out an experiment at SAR. And I sincerely acknowledge uh, financial support from ISRO, Government of India, and answer to European Union financial support. But you knew that you got the time in 2012. There is a catch because 2000, in 2012, they approved my experiment. So that is within three months. But approval does not necessarily mean that you will get a beam time. So you have to uh, fight your way to get the beam time as well. So there, there are lots of fights. Uh, so it's very, it's not so easy. Approval, there are many proposals approved, but getting beam time is another story. Another seminar is needed for that. <laughs> okay. So this is the ISOD facility at CERN. So this is the big ring that you know, uh, 27 kilometers radius that go, where the colliding beams are there. But the, actually the beam comes here from the PS booster, the proton synchrotron, and we get the beam from here to ISOLD. We take the beam from here and produce radioactive beams. And then this beam goes to so, uh, super proton synchrotron and then to the uh, this um, uh, big uh, 27 kilometer this tunnel. And here, this picture, you can see the future collider. So this is 27 kilometer, and this is the future collider of 100 kilometer circumference. So, and you can also see the statue of Nataraj that was installed by government of India at Sun. So she was cosmic uh, dance is kind of representing the destruction and production of particles at Sun. So before I move on, I'd like to just show you this uh, small video. There are two videos, but if I can show this first one, uh, what happened? Oh no, this is not the one. Uh, yeah, but it's not clicking. What? No, Which one? Okay. Oh no, it's not. Uh, but actually, I would like to show this video first, and then uh, can you just click the first one? The first YouTube video. Let's see if it is embedded from there. Yeah, so should work. 
Does it show now? No, it doesn't. Okay. Let's see. So, okay. Yeah, I, okay, I so it's better that, uh, okay, I'll show it later on. Maybe these two videos I can show later on also. No problem. Let it go. Let it go because okay, at okay. the very end, then I can show it. They could have got an idea of Azul B, but it's okay. Let's oh, so I stopped the already. I, is it now? Yeah. So can you just go next slide? Do you, Okay. Yeah, no. Okay, yes. now, so this is our experiment uh, coordinate IS554. And this is the beam line inside. So the beryllium beam, uh, so we use the beryllium 7 beam, a 5 MeV per nuclear. So these comes around this beam line. So there are actually three experimental setups. One is this mini ball with all gamma uh, detectors. Then there is a solenoidal spectrometer. And this is the scattering experiment chamber that we used. So this is the actual picture of the uh, scattering chamber. Basically, it's a vacuum chamber with uh, like 10 to the minus 6 star vacuum. And there the beam comes and hits the target. And the nuclear reaction takes place. And you uh, detect uh, the emitted fragments by several detectors. So uh, how did we produce this beryllium 7 beam? So the target uranium carbide was irradiated with 1.4 GeV protons from the PS booster offline for during three days. This activated target was then mounted on the target station and heated, and the beryllium-7 was extracted by a laser ion source. And then it's accelerated using the ISOD post accelerator. Now for radioactive beams, since the beam intensity is very low, you have to be very cautious about the impurities. You have to be you have to clean the beam very very much. So a stripping point and a dipole uh, and a dipole before the experimental station was used to clean the beam to beryllium seven four plus. So you can see since beryllium seven has four protons and three neutrons and four electrons, so you have stripped all the electrons. So it's charged in four plus. So and it's a very clean beam. So we got very good data using this beam. So this is the beam profile of um, the beryllium-7 beam, and this is the target ladder. Now, what happens is that since it's a vacuum chamber, and you need to use several targets, so you cannot just open the chamber and then change the target. Because opening the chamber will then again, doing the vacuum to 10 to the minus 6 will require 6 to 7 hours. So these targets can be uh, changed from outside. So you can see there is this collimator. So for being, uh, uh, whether the beam is properly tuned, it's properly going. So this collimator is for that. And there are several targets, uh, CD2, CH2, and MED targets. So whenever it's required, we can adjust it from the outside and uh, for, to the desired target. And this is the detector uh, setup inside the uh, chamber. So these, uh, this is actually a simulation. So you can see uh, how the detectors are set up. First, you have, you have a, these are all silicon detectors. Uh, so first, you have an annular detector, which covers forward angles 8 to 25 degree. Then you have silicon, uh, double-sided silicon strip detectors in the shape of a pentagon, which covers 40 to 80 degrees. And also, you have some back detectors which covers the back angles. And these, all these detectors, these are strip detectors. So essentially, you have horizontal and vertical strips. In the front, there is a horizontal strips. On the back, you have vertical strips. So it is 16 strips by 16. So essentially, you have 16 by 16 means 256 pixels. So all this is required because the silicon detectors are used to measure the energy and the angle of the detectors. So once you have, uh, uh, you have come to know in which, area the particle has fallen, you know the theta and phi. So all this setup is mainly to uh, um, uh, confirm what is the energy uh, lost by the um, fragments and the particular angle that this particle has fallen on the detector. Uh, and all these, uh, these strip detectors, these are backed by thick unsegmented pads to form a delta E telescope. Why is delta E? I'll just show you in the next slides, so then you will understand. Uh, what's why it's the usefulness of this and all these detectors set up the solid angle coverage is around 32 percent of four pi 
So this is this the detector area, and this is the actual uh, actual picture inside the chamber. And this you can see how these are uh, placed. So now the first thing that you once you have the spectra, first thing that you have to do is to calibrate the spectra because the data acquisition system gives spectrum in channel numbers. This is the raw spectrum. And so you have to convert them into energy. So to do that, the detectors are calibrated with a mixed alpha source. You know the energies of the alpha particles that are emitted by these sources. Now, these are a very lower energy, like 5 MeV. But since we need to measure uh, at, uh, particles with higher energy, that is a higher dynamic range, we also use the elastic peaks from Rutherford scattering of beryllium 7 and carbon 12 on lead. So those are another, some more calibration points. And then we can calibrate the whole energy spectrum. So since we had a delta E telescope, these silicon detectors, these actually give rise to these delta E spectrum. You can see these bands are typical of these different nuclei that are emitted. So these lower one is for protons, then deuterons, then helium-3, and then alpha. You can just do Bernoulli gates and cut these portions and you can know how much is the contribution of this particular particle in this particular reaction. So once you have this delta E spectrum of PD, helium-3 and alpha uh, detected by these telescopes, you can convert them into theta versus and e, e versus theta plots. Here you see this is Monte Carlo simulation and this is actual data. So you can get two distinct bands for higher excitations of this beryllium-8 to this uh, reaction. This beryllium-7 DP beryllium-8 star, which breaks up then to two alpha particles. But this beryllium eight can first go to the 16 MeV state and then break up, or it can go to this 3 MeV state, then break up. So we are actually, we noted down the contributions from each excited state to make a systematic study that the contribution from each excited, so how much is the contribution from each excited state. So this leads to this excitation energy spectrum. So you can see this is ground state, then 3 MeV state, then 11 MeV, then 16 MeV states. So the, this insert shows the excitation energy spectrum in uh, of beryllium from 0 to 22 MeV. Now, before moving to the, uh, showing you the next plot, I would just like to discuss a concept in uh, nuclear astrophysics, the astrophysical S factor. Now, Experimentally, it is more convenient to work with the astrophysical S factor rather than the cross section. So this cross section that we measure in the laboratory, that can be broken up into two parts. One is this AC, it is of nuclear origin and having weak energy dependence. And the other part is non-nuclear origin and it's a strong energy dependence. So this is the nuclear, uh, this cross section measured for this particular radiative capture reaction, helium-3 plus alpha, going to beryllium 7 plus gamma. Now, when you, you calculate the astrophysical S factor, you see it's very flat. So it's very useful because this S factor is a smoothly varying function of the energy than the cross section. It is much easier extrapolation with the astrophysical S factor. So what we do, AC often is estimated by extrapolating measurements performed at high energy. So you measure here and then you extrapolate to lower energies, which is astrophysical energies or BBN energies by assumption of a theoretical model. So this is our data. So you have these cross sections and then the astrophysical risk factors. This red dotted line is the astrophysical risk factor value that has been used in all the BBN codes for the last 30 years. Since 1988, the Kaplan and Fowler rate that is used for the last 30 years. Now, this contribution from this higher excited state has never been measured, and we measured and ultimately found it is comes out to be 167. So there is 70% increase in the contribution. By the addition of this 16.63 MeV state leads to a maximum value of 167. But even then, it is not adequate to solve the lithium anomaly. In fact, we have found that the lithium abundance is reduced by even less than one person even by 70% increase of this astrophysical S factor. So the conclusion is this contribution of higher excited states in this particular reaction do not solve the cosmological lithium problem. 
Now, once while we are doing uh, trying to solve the lithium anomaly, so we could notice that there is another anomaly by the lithium six nucleus. But in this case, the BBN predictions are just reverse. So in lithium seven, the BBN predict over predicts, while for lithium six, it under predicts. And this is happening only for the lithium nuclei. That is also very interesting. Though some of the lithium six observations are controversial, but only a few are confirmed. But then how to explain this lithium six flare? So are there novel reaction pathways or resonant enhancement of otherwise minor channels which might explain this uh, lithium six anomaly? So to, uh, to understand the lithium anomaly further, so we studied this particular reaction. This is an interesting reaction. Barium 7 D helium 3 lithium 6. In what way it is destroying barium 7? So it can affect the lithium 7 anomaly. And also it is producing lithium 6. So it can also affect the lithium 6 anomaly. So this reaction may impact both cliffs, both the cosmological lithium problems. So it was found that if the reaction rate is artificially multiplied by 100, the BBN calculation result in a 45% decrease in abundance of lithium 7 and 47% increase in the abundance of lithium 6. And the existing measurements are only at uh, ECM 4 and 6.7 MeV. So with our data, this I have hidden the data a little bit since, since it is under review. Uh, and we also got uh, uh, signatures of population of the excited states of lithium-6 in this reaction as well. But when we plotted the astrophysical S factor, we see that these are the existing data and this is our data. So we find that the S factor of D helium-3 channel is almost 50% lower than the existing data. And at BBN energies here, the this D helium-3 reaction rate is about three orders of magnitude smaller than the DP rate. So at BBN energies, we find that the DP reaction rate with respect to the presently established rate is less than two. If we take a ratio, it comes out to be less than two. Instead of the 100 that is required to solve the problem. So ultimately, what is the conclusion? That these, both these reactions, DP and D helium-3 reaction rates, have less than 1% effect on the lithium, on both the lithium-6 and lithium-7 abundances. Both channels are not able to alleviate the lithium-6-7 anomalies. So what's the outlook? So we searched for nuclear physics solution to the cosmological lithium problem through resonances at higher excitation energies that could enhance beryllium 7 destruction. We have seen that these uh, destruction channels by neutrons and D alpha channel, they cannot alleviate the lithium 7 abundance anomaly. The contribution of the beryllium 8 star excited higher excited states to this DP reaction cross section is reported for the first time. But including the contribution of the measured 16.63 MeV state, the S factor increases by 70% inside the gamma window. But the DP and DEM3 have negligible, that is less than 1% effect on the discrepancy. So the cosmological lithium problem persists and nuclear physics solutions are found to be inadequate. Now, Solutions to the lithium 6 7 anomalies are difficult to find in reaction rates and may well require physics beyond the standard model. Although we have to make sure that deuterium and helium forces, those match with the BBN calculation very well, those must remain unparted. Like in the search for solution of lithium 6 7, we cannot disturb the deuterium and helium 4 abundances. So it would be very interesting in future to see if the lithium problems truly point to new fundamental physics. So these are the publications that we are getting from this. We have already got uh, these two letters and another two letters are in uh, different, this is under review and this is under preparation from this experiment. And these, these are the fighters uh, in the experiment where Mustak has already gone to every uh, facility for rare isotope beams at Michigan State University. And here are some photos from CERN. 
and Shakunta is sitting coolly in the control room and here also. <laughs> and, uh, this is our Spanish collaborator. Uh, uh, so this is uh, a small collaboration, uh, four professors, uh, four or five professors and six graduate students. It's not like high energy physics, like 200 collaborators, it's not like that. And uh, just a moment. And I would like to acknowledge the ISO the engineers in charge, the release leather arm source team, and the target group, and financial support from European Union NSER2 and history of government of India. Now, since I'm from Bose Institute, I'd like to end this talk by a quote from uh, our founder, Jesse Bose, that the true laboratory is the mind where behind illusions, we uncover the laws of truth. Thank you very much. Now, we can, we can play the, those two videos. Those are very uh, helpful for students to understand what ISO means. We can uh, end the talk.